Welcome to the 2021 January series. We're glad that you've joined us today. My name is Ken Erfmeyer, and I serve as Vice President for Advancement at Calvin University. Today, it is my honor to introduce our speaker, Ambassador William Garverlink. At any time during this talk, please feel free to send us your questions by either emailing askjseries at calvin.edu or tweeting askjseries. Our moderator, Karen Sape, will ask these questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. On behalf of Calvin University, we want to thank Jeff and Shirley Hookstra and their family for underwriting today's event. Ambassador Garberlink has a distinguished, distinguished career with many honors. Ambassador Garberlink served as U.S. Ambassador to the Democratic Republic of the Congo from 2007 to 2010. Bill worked at the U.S. Agency for International Development where he oversaw their worldwide humanitarian assistance and democracy programs. He spent 11 years in the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance conducting assessments and direct relief operations around the world. Ambassador Garvelink holds a bachelor's degree from Calvin and a master's degree from the University of Minnesota. Bill was awarded the Distinguished Alumni Award by Calvin University in May 2007. And we are proud that he represents one of 65,000 Calvin alumni around the world. Today, Bill will be speaking about COVID-19, his experience as a senior diplomat, and why he believes pandemics will unfortunately continue to be part of our future. Now, we are excited for you to hear from the Honorable William Garverlink. And Bill, you'll be live in five, four, three, two, one. Fade to remote. Bill, you're live. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here at Calvin University's January series. Um, I would like to thank Calvin University, uh, Jeff and Shirley Hookstra for sponsoring today's event, and uh, Christy Potter for inviting me to be here. Uh, and Ken, thank you for a very nice uh, <laughs> introduction. What I would like to do today is talk a bit about the history of pandemics, being a history major, I have to do that, and in the increasing frequency of pandemics uh, that we've seen in recent years. I would also like to highlight a few things that we've learned about pandemics. And finally, I would like to offer some suggestions about how we as the United States might prepare to live in a world uh, with pandemics in our future. And I look forward to your comments and questions and, and to our discussion. So let's begin with a couple of defi definitions. The, uh, the definition of an infectious disease outbreak, um, epidemic, and a, <clears throat> excuse me, a pandemic. The difference in these three area, three terms is really one in uh, scale. An outbreak occurs when an infectious disease uh, affects a greater number of people than usual. Uh, an outbreak usually stays in one community or uh, in one geographic area. An epidemic takes place when an infectious disease outbreak spreads quickly uh, to way more people than experts would anticipate. Um, this epidemic affects a larger area than an outbreak would. And a pandemic occurs when an infectious disease spreads across countries or continents. So that's just a, a little bit to keep in mind there. Now a little bit of history. Pandemics are nothing new. Uh, the world has suffered from pandemics uh, for centuries. The Justinian bubonic plague occurred from 541 to 549. It was responsible for more than 25 million deaths. And the disease was passed to humans by fleas who were first infected by rats. And the rats traveled the world on um, uh, trading ships spreading, spreading the virus. The Black Death occurred from 1345 to 1350. It killed about 75 million people worldwide, and like the plague before, uh, rats and fleas carried the virus worldwide on ships. The third bubonic plague occurred in 1855, largely in Asia, and killed about 12 million people. And like the viruses before, it was, it was transported by rats 
and uh, fleas. The Spanish flu occurred from 1918 to 1920. Despite its name, the the pandemic came from a military base in Kansas and not from Spain. It killed 675,000 Americans and between 50 and 100 million people worldwide. The virus was transmitted to humans by birds. If, by comparison, this was at the end of World War I, and World War I uh, killed the 117,000 Americans and 16 million people worldwide. So you can compare the, the, the impact of the, the, the Spanish flu and, and World War I. HIV was, was first discovered in Africa in the 1950s, and it appeared in the U.S. in the 1970s. And so far, 32 million people have died uh, from from HIV. And uh, it was transmitted uh, from chimpanzees through bushmeat to humans in West Africa. From the 1990s to today, the world has experienced an increase in the frequency of pandemics. For example, the avian flu uh, pandemic occurred in 1997. SARS or the severe acute respiratory syndrome appeared in 2002. Swine flu emerged in 2009. MERS, or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, came along in in 2012. Uh, The most recent Ebola outbreaks occurred in 2013, 2018, and 2020. And the uh, Zika pandemic began in, in 2015. All of these pandemics were caused by zoonotic or animal-borne infectious diseases. And now uh, we have COVID-19, also a zoonotic infectious disease. Until recently, uh, these pandemics and their impacts have not been talked about much in the U.S. outside of public health programs, medical research facilities, uh, think tanks, and medical schools. And that may be because the U.S., has not really experienced the full fury of any of these recent pandemics. Now, uh, so the question is, what is causing the increase in frequency of pandemics? And the world is experiencing some global trends that may help explain the uptick in pandemics uh, in recent decades. The first global trend I would like to highlight is population growth. The world's population is 7.8 billion right now, and by 2050, it should be about 10 billion. To feed this growing population, more land must be brought under cultivation, and more land must be cleared for livestock. As a result, forests are being destroyed across the globe to make room for expanded agriculture production and livestock graving. In the process, we are eliminating wildlife habitats. Another global trend uh, that is affecting the increase in, in uh, pandemics is urbanization. The world is urbanizing faster than at any time uh, in history. More than 55% of the world's population uh, lives in urban centers today, and by 2050, that number will be 70%. Uh, to accommodate this urban expansion, cities, uh, nearby suburbs, are expanding into adjacent fields and forests, and again, are encroaching on wildlife habitats. Another trend, as you might imagine, is the destruction of the world's forests and wildlife habitats. The rapid pace of the of deforestation that is going on in the world today is a major factor in the spread of animal-borne diseases. Forests act as a buffer to keep uh, wildlife and zoonotic diseases away from humans and from livestock. The more we destroy the forest, the greater the chance that humans will have more frequent contact with wild animals and uh, be infected by zoonotic diseases uh, like COVID-19. The U.S. has a clear example of an animal-borne disease linked to the patchwork of forests in the United States that are near our cities, suburbs, and rural communities. It's Lyme disease, which is transferred to humans by deer ticks. And it's very interesting. I live in Northern Virginia, just a few miles outside of Washington, DC. And in in the past few years, 
uh, we see almost every day deers, uh, coyotes, fox in our yards and on our streets and wandering around in our neighborhood. It drives my dog nuts. Um, we didn't see that a few years ago. So the, the increase in contact with wildlife can be seen in, in a variety of different places. A global, excuse me, a global trend that, uh, that facilitates the contact between wild animals and humans is the growing international trade in wildlife. The trade in exotic animals is massive and mostly illegal. Uh, the trade is valued somewhere at 7 to $23 billion annually. It is the fourth um, most lucrative global crime after drugs, human trafficking, and illegal arms sales. Uh, and and uh, this is going on in most countries in the world. The trade's companion is wet markets, and uh, they are found in every country in the world. Some of the animals in these markets are sold for exotic pets. Other animals are butchered as uh, traditional bush meat, and still others are killed to make traditional po potions and medicines. If you've ever seen any of these markets, most of the animals are, are held in uh, or displayed in wired cages piled on top of each other. The animals are terrified, and the ones in top cages urinate, defecate, bleed, or salivate on the animals below them. And this creates the perfect conditions for pathogens to jump between animals and then from animals to the people who buy them. The U.S. is the world's second largest buyer of illegal wildlife after China. More than 75% of the infectious diseases that have emerged in the past few decades are zoonotic diseases that are passed from animals to humans. For example, the avian flu came from birds, swine flu from pigs, SARS from bats, MERS from camels, Ebola from bats, Zika came from mosquitoes, and COVID-19 again, again came from horseshoe bats. The bottom line here is most experts agree that infectious disease outbreaks will accelerate over the coming years as these global trends conspire to increase the contact between humans and wildlife. The final global trend I want to mention today is globalization. We all know that the world is becoming more and more globalized, especially in travel. We can now reach any place in the planet uh, in 24 hours. So, a baby gets Ebola in the forest in Guinea, West Africa, and Ebola appears in Texas. COVID-19 emerges in Wuhan, China, and it appears in Seattle. Whatever happens in any remote part of the world affects us all. So these global trends are mutually reinforcing, and they are fostering increased wildlife contact between humans and wildlife, and increasing the probability of more zoonotic diseases jumping from wild animals to human, and that is increasing the likelihood of more pandemics like COVID-19. We have learned a lot about pandemics over the past few decades, especially from the recent Ebola outbreaks and from the current struggles with COVID-19. Most of what experts have learned have come from pandemics prior to COVID-19. What we have seen so far from COVID-19 is how specifically a pandemic affects the United States. I would like to mention just a few of the things that we have observed from these previous pandemics. First of all, pandemics are not just domestic public health emergencies. They are crises that affect every sector of society and all aspects of a country's economy, and they are international in scope. To control pandemics domestically, countries need a national plan that lays out the responsibilities and authorities for preparing for and responding to pandemics. To build public support for the implementation of a national plan, community participation in the design is essential. 
It is equally important to communicate the elements of the plan early, clearly, and consistently to the public. The rationale for each element of the plan, especially those elements that directly affect the public, must be clearly understood. <laughs> Excuse me. To manage the spread of the virus and control the inevitable outbreaks that occur, a robust system of rapid testing, isolating, and contact tracing is essential, along with adequately trained, staffed, and equipped medical and isolation facilities. And it is essential to protect frontline workers, especially medical staff and vulnerable populations. But the most effective way to control the spread of an infectious disease, and we have seen this in all the infectious disease outbreaks since the 1918 Spanish flu, is by citizens taking personal responsibility for their own safety and the safety of others by following basic safety measure, measures, such as wearing a mask, washing hands, physical distancing, avoiding crowds, and that sort of thing. When people are vigilant, the virus can be controlled and managed. When vigilance falters, the virus surges. It is also critical to impress upon people that reopenings after lockdowns or targeted shutdowns are not or do not equate to the, safe, to the safety from the virus and a return to one's old ways. The common sense personal safety practices must continue. And now while I was preparing for, for this, uh, this talk, uh, we have now developed vaccines and inoculations are beginning. And I think it's important to spend a little time on just how vaccinations fits into the control and manage, management of uh, pandemics. Vaccines are not a silver bullet to abruptly end pandemics. Even with vaccines, it will not mean that the pandemic will be over soon. To effectively control the pandemic, 70 to 80 percent of the U.S. population will have to receive a successful vaccination or recover from the virus. And that comes to 230 to 260 million people. To reach the 70 percent immunity uh, by vaccination, more than 80 to 90 percent of the U.S. population will have to be vaccinated. None of the vaccines that we've seen so far are 100 percent effective. So some of those who are vaccinated will not develop immunity. To carry out this process, it will take many months or probably more than a year. And this is further complicated by a significant portion of the American population that is resistant to taking the vaccine. This is concerning because it will take longer to reach the 70 or 80 percent of population immunity and probably require more targeted shutdowns and, and the use of, of personal safety measures for a longer period of time. Even with vaccines, success will depend on human behavior, and that has been a problem in the United States. We are going to have to get the shots, wash up, and avoid the three C's, crowds, confined places, and close contact uh, with people for a considerable uh, period of time. Even after we have been vaccinated, we will still need to wear masks and practice personal safety measures. Keep in mind, to reach immunity uh, from a vaccination requires two shots, three or four weeks apart. And according to the experts, full immunity does not kick in until about two weeks after the second shot. Also, while the vaccines seem to be able to prevent the illness, experts still are not sure if a person who has been vaccinated uh, will be kept from getting infected and spreading the virus to others. So again, we'll have to maintain our personal protection uh, procedures. <coughs> we have lived through about a year of COVID-19. Uh, and based on what we have experienced so far, how do we, as the United States, prepare to live in a world with pandemics? It's a tough question. I have a few uh, suggestions, as you might might. Uh, expect. First, domestically. 
Pandemic preparedness should be a national security priority and funded accordingly. The U.S. should prepare and train for pandemics the way the military prepares and trains for wars. We are seeing today how COVID-19 has the capacity to bring American life to a standstill, something wars, terrorists, and natural disasters have not been able to do. The federal government should develop a new pan national pandemic preparedness and response plan that is based on what we've learned so far from, COVID, from the COVID-19 pandemic. The new plan should clarify the roles and responsibilities of federal, state, local, and tribal authorities for preparing for and responding to pandemics. The national planning process should be transparent and carried out with the full participation of state, local, and tribal authorities and community leaders. The national plan should identify which officials will provide guidance and information to the American public about the pandemics and the response procedures. The guidance and information should be frequent, clear, scientifically accurate, and above all, consistent. The president should reestablish the Global Health Security and Biodefense Directorate within the National Security Council. The directorate should be the focal point and coordinating authority within the U.S. government to oversee the infectious disease preparation activity, preparedness activity, and the design and implementation of the national response plan. The national plan should ensure that the strategic national stockpile is appropriately stocked with medicines and equipment and it's fully funded. The national plan should clearly specify which officials manage the stockpile, the terms governing access to the stockpile, and the contents and how the contents are to be used. <coughs> the federal government, in cooperation with state, local, and tribal authorities, should not, wait a minute, I just skipped the point here. The national plan should clearly, spe uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm over here. Okay, the federal government, in cooperation with state, local, and tribal authorities, should design and fund a comprehensive national system for the rapid testing, isolating, and contact tracing of infectious disease outbreaks. Without this system, when an outbreak occurs, U.S. responders will not be able to pinpoint the origin of the outbreak or the rate of transmission. And as a result, they will not be able to deliver a fast response that is calibrated to local conditions. We have seen this over and over again over the past year where there is an outbreak, and because of lack of information, the, the governing authorities decide to uh, shut down an entire community, uh, an entire town, uh, close all restaurants. If they knew where the, the outbreak was occurring with some precision, which this would provide, they could target this, uh, these shutdowns rather than just do the blunt instrument of closing down everything. As part of the National Preparedness and Response Plan, the U.S. should design and undertake a national education campaign to inform citizens of the procedures for coping with infectious disease outbreaks. A major focus of the education campaign should be on the individual's responsibility during a pandemic and on the value of wearing masks hand washing, physical distancing, and, and other such procedures. Finally, uh, the President and the Congress <laughs> should create an independent bipartisan commission to examine our nation's response to COVID-19. A model for this commission would be the 9-11 Commission that was put together in 2002 after, after the terrorist attacks on the United States. The COVID-19 Commission should study what worked and, would, and did not work at all levels of government and make actionable recommendations to ensure that the United States is fully prepared 
for future pandemics. The commission should be composed of officials from all levels of government, scientists, and members of civil society. It should be fully funded and have a very robust, robust professional staff. Excuse me. Since pandemics are international crises, the United States should be prepared to engage internationally in response to a pandemic. The new national plan should include a framework for multilateral cooperation and bilateral assistance to poorer countries in response to the pandemic. The U.S. should rejoin the World Health Organization and advocate for reforms to strengthen the institution. The United States should urge the United Nations to establish a permanent global health security coordinator position to lead the coordination among UN agencies. The coordinator should report directly to the United Nations Secretary General. The United States should recommend that the United Nations create and fund a pandemic early warning system, much like the famine early warning system that has been developed and is managed by the United States Agency for International Development. This is important. Such an early warning system under the direction of the UN coordinator would make the alerts of infectious disease outbreaks much less dependent on the transparency of a nation or nation first affected by the disease. As we saw in uh, Wuhan, China, uh, they were reluctant early on to, to uh, broadcast or announce uh, the outbreak. The U.S. should support the World Health Organization's global vaccination development and distribution facility known as COVAX. The objectives of the COVAX system are to accelerate the development and manufacture of COVID-19 vaccines and to guarantee fair and equitable access to the vaccines by every country in the world. 190, 190 countries have joined the COVAX facility. The United States and Russia have not. The U.S., in cooperation with other donor governments and the United Nations, uh, should expand the bilateral assistance programs to poor countries to strengthen their public health systems so they can detect, respond to, and control infectious disease outbreaks that emerge in their own countries or region. This is in our national interest. Based on last year's experience <coughs> excuse me, with COVID-19, preventing a pandemic is far less costly <coughs> than responding to one in the United States. I have just a couple of, of concluding thoughts. <clears throat> As we noted before, in our globalized world uh, with a growing population, urbanization, and the rapid destruction of wildlife habitats, we are going to see more pandemics and likely more contagious than COVID-19. Pandemics are different from other disasters. Most crises are limited in geography and duration, like earthquakes, hurricanes, wildfires, uh, even terrorist attacks. But pandemics can occur anywhere, spread everywhere at any time, and last for months or years. The pandemics as we talked about, have national and international dimensions, and we must respond to both simultaneously to beat a pandemic. As long as a pandemic festers in any part of the world, none of us is truly safe. And finally, we do not yet have the ability to prevent pandemics, but with successful domestic and international preparedness, rapid response capacities, and the citizens taking responsibility for their own safety, we can mitigate and manage pandemics. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Karen Salpi. I chair the I chair the English department here at Calvin. 
feel free again to m email your questions to Bill Garvelik, uh, to askjseries at calvin.edu, or tweet to hashtag askjseries. I think it's interesting that questions have been coming in primarily on email. I don't know why that's interesting. <laughs> um, so here's our first question from a viewer. It is my understanding that Presidents Clinton, Bush, and Obama each created their own national pandemic plans. How would you recommend the implementation of a continuous operational plan for our nation, perhaps through a permanent cabinet position for biosecurity? Uh, yeah, uh, if you go back basically to the Clinton administration, um, the, all the succeeding administrations have created pandemic plans, they've done all sorts of things, and then funding uh, dies out and the interest in it due to other activities wanes. And that's why I, when I mentioned I was, I was very specific, I think this, uh, the, uh, the pandemic plan should be under the direct guidance of the National Security Council. I found from my experience that when agencies, whether it's Homeland Security, state, USAID, or others, at the same level, cannot tell other organizations or other agencies what to do. You need someone who is above that, and that's the National Security Council that reports uh, to the president and to the National Security Advisor. You need a more senior group watching this process, overseeing the preparedness and the response plans that has the ability to instruct other parts of the U.S. government in terms of what they should do. So I would favor um, reestablishing the, the directorate uh, in, in uh, the National Security Council and give it more authority. Perhaps this is a job for the vice president specifically and have that organization oversee all other U.S. government agencies and, and uh, manage the process. Like I said, if you have one government agency in charge, they can make suggestions to other agencies, but they can't command and control what goes on. So I would put the authority in the National Security Council and make it much more forceful than it has been up to this point. Thank you. Uh, here's another one. Many of the suggestions you have focus on policy and public health practices. However, many of the reasons you give for the emergence of pandemic diseases are ecological. Do you have thoughts on what ecological, environmental, and or sustainability practices and policies would help to prevent or control future pandemics? And there's a related question about whether, say, vegan or vegetarian practices would be sufficiently helpful to make a difference here. <laughs> well, frankly, you're getting way beyond my expertise here. I, uh, I'm not a medical person or a scientist. Uh, I'm a generalist who, who specializes in disaster responses. So I, I, again, I just uh, think this should, uh, the, all these uh, interests, the, uh, certainly the uh, climate change, ecology, all of this should be given higher priority within the United States government and for that matter within the United Nations. And that there should be resources and uh, and professional staff to address these issues and take them up to the National Security Council and raise them uh, to, to the senior levels of the United States government. I don't think that, that certainly hasn't been done recently, and I don't think it has been done sufficiently uh, in previous administrations. Do you have examples of, uh, can you uh, refer to examples where countries are doing this well, not, not just for COVID-19, but in general, countries that are really good at managing similar crises? Well, there, uh, certainly in Asia, which is, has had a fair amount of experience with this, you'll find the Japanese, uh, the experience everybody knows about, I think, is New Zealand that has been very successful. Um, and I think Taiwan has done an excellent job uh, as well. And in Africa, strangely enough, or maybe not, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo has a bit of experience with Ebola outbreaks since they've had about 10 of them. And they, they have a, a fairly elaborate system of how you deal with infectious diseases, and they're, they're pretty good at it. Um, but I think when it comes to European countries and the United States, we just have fortunately been generally spared from, from the full impact of, of a lot of the the epidemics and pandemics that have emerged in recent years, and we are woefully unprepared for
for that, not for lack of warning, but for lack of resources uh, and dollars uh, to, to actually do what has to be done. Have suggestions like the ones you've made to us for dealing with future pandemics been communicated to the Biden team? Who's, who's talking with them right now about these things? Um, I don't know who they have exactly. Um, I do believe, I think, a uh, Kelvin graduate uh, is fairly involved and is talking to um, the Biden team on a regular basis, Jeremy Conondike. Mm -hmm. um, and I know some of the people who have been very involved in this uh, from the Center for Strategic and International Studies who left the government and went there uh, with the, when the Trump administration came in are very much engaged with the, um, the Biden team. And I know for a fact that there are some people who have already been announced for appointments that have, have strong interests in these areas and, and will we'll take a very forceful approach uh, in, in January, February, and, and beyond. Good to hear. Um, <laughs> let me ask you, you, you mentioned you're not a medical professional, but I'll ask anyway. Um, one of our alumni says, I have had and recovered from COVID-19. I'm 66 years old and I'm eligible for the immunization next week. Would that give me double safety of immunity or is it just a safe precaution to prevent me from getting it again because we don't know enough? And, and a related question, uh, how, d doesn't understand how could I transmit it if I've already had it? Can you answer? Well, <laughs> well I, I can give you my two cents worth, which the, uh, keeping in mind, I really don't know a whole lot about this, just what I read on these issues. And uh, my understanding is that even if you've had COVID, it's wise to get the, take the vaccine uh, because they still don't know from what I can tell, if you've had and recovered from COVID, how long your immunity lasts. And so it is wise to go through the, the vaccination process uh, just to add, uh, to, to make sure that you, you have immunity uh, for a longer period of time. And uh, what was the second part of the question? Um, uh, I'm looking at so many questions at once. Oh, <laughs> uh, is it necessary to get the vaccination if you've already had COVID to prevent transmitting it to other? Can you still carry it if you've already had it? Uh, my, for, again, from people I've talked to and from what I've read, uh, yeah, you can still transmit it. So you still have to go through the, the, the masks and all the stuff for a considerable period of time. They're doing a lot of tests now, which, you know, as, as you know, when they did the tests for the, the two vac uh, vaccines, they did not really look into the implications of whether you can transmit the disease and how long the, the immunity would last uh, once you recovered from from uh, uh, COVID-19. So those studies are just starting now. So it'll be a while before, before the scientists can speak authoritatively on those questions. Here's a question from a student. How effective can public education about pandemic preparedness be if public information is contested for its truth value by our polarized nation? Well, that's a, that's a fair question. And uh, that's a problem. <clears throat> for my perspective, I would listen to the scientists. Um, and because on these kinds of issues, they're going back to uh, outbreaks uh, of Ebola and others that they've, uh, people have been involved in. And like wearing masks, like washing, like distancing, those are critical uh, uh, activities that we're involved in bringing it in to Ebola in 2013 in West Africa. I was very much involved in working on those issues. And in the Congo, uh, uh, the, the outbreak in 2018 that ended about six months ago, and then another one in another part of the Congo that began in uh, 2020, those kinds of concerns were very, very important to bringing an end to the, to the, the pandemic. Um, can you compare Ebola and the response with COVID-19, uh, responses to each? Well, <clears throat> a lot of the things that were very successful in Ebola are, a lot of, are some of the things I've mentioned. You've got to have community involvement. Uh, you've got to understand the culture. We, when I, I consult with the, the International Medical Corps, an NGO, 
and we had about 2,000 people in West Africa. We brought anthropologists with us. And what happened, no one could figure out why the disease was spreading so fast. And once we got some anthropologists in the country, it was very quick. They said, well, it's burial practices. Uh, when someone dies, you wash them, you kiss them uh, before they're buried. Well, with Ebola, uh, a body is most contagious right after, after death. So you'd have a funeral, and everybody at the funeral would, would, would get Ebola. You've got to understand the culture. And then even in the United States with COVID-19, I think people underestimate, again, I'm jumping back and forth, but now, now I'll go back to uh, Ebola, whether it's the Congo or West Africa. You're basically going to a population and say, you know, the way you've lived, the way your culture, the way you do things, you can't do that anymore. You've got to stop. And here's why. And I think that's an important part that has been missed in the United States. You've got to wear masks. You've got to do these other things. And here's why it's really important. We're not making this crap up. It's important. It's, it's tested. It's one of the most, uh, you know, easiest and well-known factors in all pandemic outbreaks. But you've got to explain it to people. And you've got to, you've got to you know, kind of deal with them where they are. And you need religious leaders or community leaders who they know to explain this to them. And that worked really well in West Africa and the Congo. We got religious leaders, community leaders, uh, of all other kind of leaders in the community to go to understand what was going on and what had to happen. And they were the ones who explained it. You don't have somebody stand in Washington and say, here's the deal. That doesn't that doesn't sink in with people. So I think somehow we've missed, you got to deal with people where they are and listen to their problems and figure out how to make it work given their difficulty. You talked in our class this morning about in your career as a diplomat, learning, getting to know people and, and developing really networks of communication so that when, when there wasn't always a possibility of direct channel A to channel C, you, you, you go through B. And, and what you're saying here is that we need to communicate through networks that already exist, networks of trust. Yes. Um, Here's a, a question from an emergency physician in Southern California. He said, I daily see the havoc wreaked by this pandemic. One of the saddest observations I've had has been seeing and hearing skepticism toward the scientific process and public health measures directed at ending this pandemic. At times, this skepticism is rampant in the church and elsewhere. As Christians, how do we advocate for belief in God as the one who empowers us to observe and learn about his world and yet endorse the scientific principles both in the church and community around us globally, nationally, and locally? What a Calvin University question to ask. <laughs> but I, but I, it, it's an important one. And, and I think it, from, from the faith that I have and, and, and the way I interpret it, uh, I always go back to the, the, the parable of the talents. Um, we've been given talent to figure out things. And, uh, and science is a very important part of that. And we have scientists and we have our own minds to understand how this works. And, and uh, we're expected, I think, we're expected to use this stuff to solve our own problems. And science is the way to do it. And we have to trust our scientists. And, and uh, if, you know, we can avoid that and say it's God's will, well, God wants you to get on with it, figure it out, <laughs> and not hide your talents. And uh, I, I don't think he, my two cents worth, he doesn't operate that way, that I'll fix things for you. I've given you the talents to fix them. And science is the way to do it in this particular instance. So I, you know, I don't know what else to say about that. That's I just feel very strongly about that. And I get very frustrated when people say, "Ah, oh, you know, God wills. We're going to go to church, and whatever happens, happens." Well, that that's not biblical. That's for sure. God sends the rowboat. There's a joke about that, yeah? Yes. Okay. Um, how do you balance the need to mitigate spread with the consequences of shutting down businesses and not providing other kinds of health care to, to people? So the ramifications of shutdowns. 
Well, I, I, I don't see the two as mutually exclusive. If we have our proper system of contact tracing, testing, isolating, we should be able to identify very quickly where the outbreaks are coming from. And you may shut down uh, uh, one restaurant, one bar, something like that, and, and the area block around it or, or, or that kind of thing rather than just saying, okay, we're, we're shutting them all down. That, we have not done a good job of building a system for testing, contact tracing, uh, and isolating. And then when we ask someone, people say, well, you've got to isolate for two weeks. Well, go to home, going, isolating at home usually doesn't work well. So you should have to go to another facility that's prepared for you, and that should be run by the government, and people who are asked to isolate themselves should be compensated for that. I mean, they can't just walk away from their job and say, okay, for two weeks, I don't get paid, I isolate. No, no, they have to <clears throat> be helped through this process. So I think we need a lot more in our program design on how, on how to assist people. And I think, again, it's listening to them, finding out, having the system to, to, to test talk to the people where the, the problem is perceived and figure out a way. And, and we, have, we haven't developed any of those systems in a significant way to make this a little more focused rather than using these blunt instruments of shutting the city down. That, that, that just does all kinds of problems. But I don't think that's necessary if we had the, the tools we need uh, to deal with COVID. As is often the case, it appears we're going to need about six more hours to cover all the questions. So let me apologize in advance for the many, many, literally hundreds of questions that are coming in that won't get asked. Uh, but I'll, I'll do this one. So there was a question about um, why have we been less successful in addressing COVID-19 than in addressing other recent outbreaks that could have been disastrous in the United States? And this related question, now that the United States has seriously felt the effects of a global pandemic, do you think we'll take the threat of them more seriously in the future? Well, let me do the, <coughs> the, second, <coughs> excuse me, the second part first. Yes, I, I think um, Without, without getting all wrapped up in politics, I think uh, the, the, the new administration has been paying attention here. And the, some of the appointments that have been, out, been announced have been involved in dealing with Ebola or that came a few years ago and our responses to help the countries in West Africa and that sort of thing. I think we're going to take it much more seriously. Um, I think, the, you know, <clears throat> from my perspective, the, the, the pandemics that have appeared uh, really have not had a dramatic impact on the U.S. like, like now. And if you go back through, you know, from Clinton on up to Trump, uh, we get excited about this. And then what, uh, this is more from a development side, what we do is we're very quick to fund diseases, cures or, or vaccines for diseases, like with our PEPFAR thing, with, with AIDS. Uh, when the Ebola thing hit and then, uh, disappeared or ended, and then the Zika problem came up a little bit later, all the money that was set aside to understand Ebola was shifted to Zika. Zika. <laughs> Zika. And the issue is we need to focus on public health systems, not on individual diseases. We need to take public health systems so countries, the, the United States included, do, do a far better job of quickly identifying that there's an outbreak there, and then have a, a, a public health system that can respond to that quickly. That's the testing and that sort of stuff. We have not focused, and if you look historically at budgets, we have not put a lot of money into public health systems. And that's a huge mistake. And I think it's finally come home. Um, all I have to do is listen a couple of times to, to Dr. Fauci, who uh, is worth listening to. Um, and he will focus on public health systems and the importance of getting that right. And I think that's a big issue. In my I don't know mind, if I answered your question. In my mind, you've just answered the question I'm about to ask. How can this country continue addressing the needs of the rest of the world when there's so much need here at home? Yes, we have it better than money, but which obligation must we meet first, domestic or foreign? I think you're saying both. They, they, go, they go hand in hand. You cannot. Um, deal with the international problems uh, in sequence. 
say we're taking care of ourselves, then something help happens elsewhere in the world and say now we'll focus on that. It takes years to build systems and we should focus on the public health systems of the various countries. Um, they all need help and it's, 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 but it's far cheaper uh, to put money in and the United States doesn't have to do this alone. That's why you have the United Nations and the European countries and Australia and Japan and New Zealand. Uh, if we put in a few billion dollars, we'd have a dramatic impact. And then we wouldn't have to spend trillions of dollars in the United States to deal with what's happening here. If we had done and had maintained a well-funded uh, aid program in health, we should have been able to identify this earlier and maybe prevent it from coming to the United States. The Agency for International Development used to have a project um, that this administration canceled called PREDICT. And that ran for six or seven years and it was all over the world identifying where they're, they're the most likely places for the potential outbreaks of infectious diseases and would help those areas down to the city level or community level, how to prepare to identify them quickly and respond to them quickly so they don't get out of their community or certainly their country. That's the kind of activities we have to fund worldwide along with the United Nations, the UK and the European Union and all these other countries and organizations to help poor countries cope with this stuff. And again, it's in our national interest. It's better we help them solve it in their territory than having it show up in Texas or in Seattle and what we have now. You can't separate our, our, our interest in the United States anymore from the world. We're too globalized and you can't stop that. We got to get along with it, not bitch about it. It's, it's here. I feel like I'm asking these questions in reverse order uh, to your answers, <laughs> but the next one is, is it reasonable to think that the Chinese could have or should have contained the virus? Would that be, have been a realistic? I, 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 I don't think that anybody is 100% sure how the virus has, has, uh, has emerged and got to humans. Uh, some say it's the horseshoe bats. Uh, there's this crazy idea that it was done in a lab and, and released, which uh, no one gives credence to that I've dealt with. Um, but, you know, we've got to figure out how to fix the system. It is an issue. Right now, the World Health Organization has a team waiting to go to China to focus on this question that's uh, where, the, where the outbreak started. And China has given them a runaround. And I don't think they've made it in yet, at least last week. So that's why we got to focus more of it. There's a long discussion that could be held on the World Health Organization, which has the mandate but not the authority. Uh, to do what it's suspected to do, expected to do. It needs more authority. It needs some oomph behind it. And that means the United States, <coughs> excuse me, and the European Union and the Brits and the other, and the, hopefully the Russians uh, say that they can enforce uh, the rules. There's the international, international health regulations that have been set up years ago to deal with specifically these kinds of issues, and they've languished. And, and that's not because of the World Health Organization. It's because the countries have not given the World Health Organization the authority it needs. We've got to fix the whole system if we want to really deal with this. <coughs> Excuse me, not just our own, but the, the, the UN system. You, uh, we have to toughen it up. You've given us good advice. Do, are you optimistic that it's going to be implemented as we transition to a new administration? It has to be. Um, it, 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 I, I'm optimistic, yes. And uh, it, it simply has to happen. One thing that you know, people don't talk about much because it's kind of scary and I don't, I don't like to, <laughs> to bring up these sorts of things. COVID-19, <coughs> in terms of deaths, about 1% of the population that gets COVID dies. And we're at very high numbers. Ebola... Now, that's a little harder to catch. The death rate is 50 to 60 percent. There's Nipah, 
uh, virus, which you see in Asia once in a while, the death rate is 75% of people who are infected. There are much more infectious pandemics, infectious diseases out there. And we've got to be ready for this because, you know, some people uh, keep reminding us all this was not the big one that is very infectious. That's out there, too. So we've got to get this right and we've got to do it now. OK, I yeah. have good news no. just in from a viewer. Biden just announced a National Security Council appointees and restores the Office for Global Health Threats. He must have been listening to this today. <laughs> well, that's good news. I like to that's think good so. News. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm going to switch to an unrelated, well, it won't be unrelated. This comes from a student. What elements of your education at Calvin and or elsewhere do you feel equipped or helped shape you to do the work that you did all around the world? <laughs> okay. I think I am extremely proud of, and, and it has been enormously helpful to me is a good liberal arts education. If you can read, you can write logically and clearly, you can do just about anything. If you want to be an emergency doc or, or uh, epidemiologist, that's a different sort of skills. Uh, and you have to get those. But if you are equipped with a very solid uh, liberal arts education, you can adjust and do just about anything out there. And that certainly was helpful to me. I wanted to be a historian. That was my job. That was what I was planning for from Calvin to graduate school to teaching Latin American history. It didn't work out. And uh, I'm actually quite glad of that as we <laughs> talked about. <laughs> um, but I think for the other jobs that I, I ended up at a very young age in the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and I wrote some reports and some other documents that went over very well. Kelvin helped me with that, taught me to write and, and, and how to think logically. And in the other jobs, I had to learn quickly. In the disaster field, the, there's no training to be a disaster specialist and go into the middle of a war zone and manage a humanitarian You don't think program. being a, a resident assistant would be perfect training for that? I, I think that may be the best training that's out there for that particular job. But for all of these things, I think I, I was given a, a great education at Calvin College to, to just be able to deal with these things logically. Thank so you. So I'm, I'm a fan of a liberal arts education, big time. I am too. <laughs> Thank you for spending the hour with us. We're grateful to Shirley and Jeff Hoekstra for underwriting today's presentation. And personally, I wish they could be in the room with all of us and with you. But gathering online is the next best thing. Please join us Monday for a conversation with Tara Westover. And in the meantime, have a great weekend. <laughs>